Good evening, church. Okay, I know, I know this is the younger one and it got even younger because we were dedicating children. So good evening, church. All right. Now, uh, I, I just want to say I, I really thank God uh, that we get the opportunity to dedicate our children to Him. Uh, I want to say that because uh, some of you, when I saw here, some of you were people I grew up with in church. Dan Lowe, I'm just calling you out. <laughs> Um, but some of them, you, you're dedicating your children. They're not even babies anymore. And I know some of you probably at the back there in the seats there just kind of like place your hand on your teenage kid and go, uh, I'm going to say the parents' commitment and I'm going to speak life over you as well. Because at any stage of your life, some of you were, some of you were not even believers when your children were born. And then when your children were born and, you, had fam- and you, you raised this family and then you come to know Jesus and then you realize Jesus didn't just change my life, Jesus changed my entire family's life and my children will be dedicated to the Lord. And so the next time we do this child dedication, I want to encourage you really, you know, think about this, consider it well. I've dedicated all four of my kids and if you've not hit four, Bring it on. Um, But the idea is to say, Lord, here we are. We're parents. We want to raise our children in the ways of the Lord. And I know that our children are protected and will be raised by you in your ways. Amen. Amen. I I was reading um, 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel is the story of uh, uh, Hannah who prayed for a child and then she dedicated that child to the Lord. And she did. She, she, she proceeded and, 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 and did what she promised to the Lord. But one of the things I realized, and it was just interesting to just kind of read First Samuel, is this. Every year, she would visit her son. Now, dedication at that time means I dedicate. doesn't mean I dedicate, then you come back to my house. Dedicate Samuel to the Lord was I leave Samuel in the hands of Eli and the priests to be raised up in serving the Lord in the temple. So I will only get to see you once a year when all of Israel will come together at the temple and worship the Lord together. And then she would bring Samuel, Hannah would bring Samuel a new robe. It's almost like every Chinese New Year, you buy something new, you buy new clothes, right? So she sees Samuel and she gives him a new robe. And in, throughout her life, and she had kids after that, but throughout her life, she would remember that my son, Samuel, was dedicated to the Lord. And when you dedicate your children to the Lord, it doesn't mean that they, was, they will live here you know, seven days and then you only come once a week and then you say hi and then after you leave. No. But you will raise them up and God will raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And that was what God did for Samuel. God, Samuel was a very prominent judge in Israel throughout his life because He was dedicated to the Lord just as much as your children have been dedicated to the Lord. Shall we pray, church? Father, we just want to commit today to you and and ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to us even as we look into your word, even as we look into what you desire to see in our lives. May we live out a life that carries a heart that counts. And so I commit today's message to you. I commit the word to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through this series in Samuel on the life of King David, Um, and and so today I want to just look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is is an intermediately lengthy chapter, um, and and I would definitely encourage you to read through it. Uh, I won't go through it from 1 to all the way to the end, uh, but I want to just tell you a bit of background as to what 2 Samuel chapter 7 is about. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is essentially a conversation between two people. Two people, but with one person in between. All right, so let me give you a bit of uh, an idea of what that looks like. It starts off in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and uh, maybe a bit more context. 2 Samuel chapter 6 was, if you remember, it was David bringing the Ark of the Covenant from Kiriath Jerim to Jerusalem. All right, and so there was this huge story in that uh, transfer of the Ark of the Covenant uh, having to do with Uzzah who touched the Ark and then he died. Uh, and then subsequently, David then kind of inquiring of the Lord and making sure that the, this time around he will bring the Ark safely to Jerusalem with praise and with dancing and all that. And so once the Ark was in Jerusalem, it was set up in the tabernacle, just 
the same tabernacle as designed by God given to Moses back in the day. And then 2 Samuel 7 starts off with this little conversation that David has with a man by the name of Nathan. You would know Nathan throughout the story of David's life as a prophet, someone who spoke into David's life, someone who David inquired for counsel. And so he told Nathan, he said, how is it possible, and I'm paraphrasing, how is it possible that I'm living in a palace and the ark of God is in a tent? Now, here's how I imagine it would look like. He's looking out from his palace, he's looking out the window, and he's looking at his kingdom. And then maybe, you know, within, within sight, not too far away, is this tabernacle, the priests are there, and the ark of God is inside there. And obviously, because the ark of God is inside there, you cannot see the ark, but you know it's in there. You brought it all the way down to Jerusalem. You know it's in there. And then Nathan comes behind him into his... Uh, into his chamber or in his throne room, wherever it is. And he's looking out this window. Nathan comes behind him. David looks at Nathan and goes, hey, come here. So Nathan walks over to David. And then David says this. See, now. And I'm reading from the ESV. 7 verse 2. See, now. I dwell in a house of cedar. It's made of timber. I dwell in a house of cedar. But look. The ark of God lives in a tent. Today we're talking about David's desire to build the temple, the temple of God. For all this time, from the time that the tabernacle was built in the wilderness, brought all the way to the promised land, after all the conquests that Joshua did and the judges, the ark of God was always in a tabernacle. It was always in a tent. And when the Ark of God came back from the Philistines and then left in, uh, in, in Kiriath-Jerim and then subsequently brought to Jerusalem, all that time, the Ark of God was still in a tent. And 2 Samuel chapter 7 is almost like a turning point in the heart of the king and in that sense also all of Israel to say, actually, this Ark, we should build a temple to place this Ark. We should build a temple to host the presence of God. So David tells this to to Nathan. Nathan says, I know what you're thinking. Whatever it is, go and do. God is with you. But then Nathan goes back, and then God tells Nathan something else that Nathan had not yet heard from God before this. And essentially, God tells Nathan, David is not the one who will build the temple. David is not the one. I will appoint somebody else to do it. But because David's desire was to build the temple, I will bless him. I will bless his house. I will bless his family. I will bless him. And, I, and, and there's one famous line at the end that his throne will be established forever. So Nathan wakes up maybe the next morning, goes back to David and says, hey, wait, remember that conversation by the window? This is what God is saying. He tells you this. He will bless you. He will establish your throne forever. But you're not going to build a temple. And so then David at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 7, David now prays to God and says, Who am I? Who am I that, that you would bless me, that you would establish my throne forever? And then he says, Well, who are you to be able to do such great things? You must clearly be the Lord of all the earth, be the God of all. That, in a nutshell, is 2 Samuel chapter 7. A conversation between David and God with a man by the name of Nathan right smack in the middle, just to kind of convey a few things from the Lord to David. But the beauty of this conversation, the beauty of this conversation lies in understanding what was on David's heart. And this is why I say it's the heart that counts. This is why I say today it's the heart that counts. Because the other thing I'll tell you about 2 Samuel chapter 7 is this. And most of us, if you've read the story of David, you know David wanted to build a temple. You know David could not build a temple. You will probably know David prepared the, the raw materials to build a temple. And then David charged Solomon, his son, when I die and your turn to be king, you will build a temple. We know most of that in, in, in that sequence. But 2 Samuel chapter 7 is very early on in David's reign. Everything you else you read about David and the temple, you will find in Second Chronicles, sorry, First Chronicles, chapter twenty-two 
to 29. And that is at the end of David's reign. Most of what we understand of the building of the temple is in 1 Chronicles 22 to 29. If you have your Bibles now, just open it. Like just flip through it. Just scan through it. 1 Chronicles 22 to 29 is David saying to Israel, this is what I have prepared for the temple. I know the Lord said you will not build it. Your son will because you are a man of war. But this is what I have prepared for the temple. And then he lists down everything that he has prepared, the raw materials and, and all of that. And we'll go into that a bit more later. It's mind-blowing, actually, if you think about what David did to prepare Solomon to build the temple. So we'll look into that a bit more. But all of that is 1 Chronicles 22 to 29. That is at the end of David's reign. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is at the start or the earlier part of David's reign. Do you know how many years David was king of Israel? In total, 40 years. 40 years king of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is only within the first few years. And then 40 years later, he repeats everything that he wanted to do to build the temple. Here's the question. Well, here's the point. David was a man not of mere talk, but of action. David was a man not of mere talk, but of action. When he told Nathan, look, I live in a palace of cedar and this ark of God lives in a tent. Nathan didn't question, you know, so what do you want to do? He knew exactly what David wanted to do. And so he said, whatever it is you want to do, do it, God is with you. Because he knew whatever David was going to do, it would be to host or house the presence of God in a more powerful way than it, this, than it was doing now. And so Nathan was like, whatever you want to do, you're going to do. Now, 40 years later, he could have changed his mind. How many of you, you know this, you, you, you come before God and you say, God, if you get me out of this mess that I'm in, I will sign up for Sevolution. Or God, if you free up my time, I will sign up for 30th anniversary. Because, you know, my cello is in the storeroom and I know it's there for a purpose. But God, please get me out of this first, then I'll go and sign up. And then God says, I will do it for you. I will bless you. I will help you. I will get you out of this. And then five minutes later, oh God, sorry, I had another appointment that I've got to deal with. Or whatever that reason is. And I'm not here to judge but the reality in David's life was this. He was a man not of mere talk, but of action. And I'll tell you this. It wasn't like after 40 years, he go, oh yeah, I was supposed to build a temple. Huh? I'll tell you why later on. But it is not possible for David, only 40 years later, to suddenly remember, I'm supposed to build a temple. I'm supposed to prepare for the temple. And so then he, he, he prepares all the, the raw materials and all that for the temple. It cannot, it, it, to me, it is not possible for that to happen. He would have... He would have he must have done it ever since he desired to build a temple for the Lord all the way throughout his 40 years. He was a man not of mere talk, but of action. And my challenge to us is this, that we would not just be mere talk, but of action. And the difference between someone who's, who, who promises God but then forgets, or promises God but then changes, or promises God and then keeps that promise for 40 years, is that it is your heart that counts. That's why I titled my message today, It's the Heart That Counts. Because you could go, I mean, you think about this story, 2 Samuel 7, and, and how God would make so many covenant promises with David. And he hasn't even built the temple, no. It's like how someone says, I was supposed to get you your birthday gift. I just didn't have time. And then you very graciously go, it's the thought that counts. And then you feel exonerated. Like, okay, never mind, next year, next year. Why would God give David so many covenant promises in 2 Samuel chapter 7 if it was only David's thought? It was David's heart that counts. It was only David's heart that counts. And so God knew David would follow through because it has always been on his heart. 
And in that sense, he would stop at nothing to get it done. He would pave the way as smoothly as possible for the building of the temple. And so if you look now at 2 Samuel chapter 7, so if you're in 1 Chronicles 22, don't worry, we'll get back there, but turn back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. When the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, first thing you realize when he made this decision to build the temple for the Lord was that life was good. David made this decision when his life was good. No war, no stress, no problems, no major issues. He looked out of his palace and looked at the tabernacle and he said, hey, I got a nice palace, uh, but the God of the universe lives in a tent. How is that possible? This almost looks so unfair. Me, human being, nice palace, God of the universe in a tent. Maybe, you know, in, in, in the wilderness with the Israelites, the tabernacle looked a lot better than your house because you lived in tents as well. But by the time they settled in the promised land, they could build their own house. And then the king would obviously have a nicer house than everybody else. And now the tent looks a bit miserable compared to the palace. And so in David's heart, I've got to build a temple for God. God is still parked in the tent, no. But we've been parked in nice houses. I've been parked, the King David says, I've been parked in the palace. So the question from here is this. When life is going well, what does your heart pursue? When life is going well, what does your heart pursue? You see, our heart will always long for or pursue something, whether life is going well or not. And sometimes it's easier to see it when life is not well. You know, then, then the things that you pursue are a bit more tangible. I want my health back. Or I want my finances back. I want my family to come back together. I want restoration of, of relationships. I want a sense of hope come back into my life again. Whatever it is, it looks a bit more tangible because you're going through a difficult time. You're going through a problem. But when God has answered your prayers, when God has established you like He did for David as king, both of Israel and of, uh, for both of, of all of Israel and then Judah as well. So throughout all of Israel, David is already king. He has established you already. He's placed you in honor. He's p- protected you. He's brought you through all of that. Then the question is, what does your heart pursue? Now remember this. The Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 7 does not say that David has reached the pinnacle of his kingship. He has not, you know, amassed it all. He has not reached the height or the peak of his kingship. And if you know the story, the his, you know world history, every person who has been king and has some level of ambition would say, what I have now is not enough. Napoleon, Genghis Khan, all the Persian kings that you read about in the Bible, they always conquered and conquered and conquered and conquered until they could not. They always wanted more. It was never enough. When life is going well for them, when they have conquered this territory, they say, we will get some more. When life was going well for David, it was different. When life is going well for you, A lot of times, we look at our lives and go, yeah, it's well. It could be better. I can put in a bit more work and earn a bit more. I could put in a bit more effort into this or to that and develop myself even more. But when David's life went well, David kept his heart on God. Could he have renovated his palace? Yeah. Could he have had more wives? The, sorry, let me just say, the Bible does not condone it, but it happened. Could David decide to expand the kingdom? Yeah. But when life was going well, when there was no war, he didn't start anymore. He looked at the tabernacle and said, I think God deserves a temple. David kept his heart on God. So what does it mean then when we say life is going well? Two things. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 1, 
sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. It says there, David was living in his house and he had rest from his surrounding enemies. He lived in his house and he had rest from surrounding enemies. Now, it doesn't mean he had no stress at all. Huh? Anyone who has had more than one wife would know. Anyway, but he's also got kids. He's also got kids he's got to deal with. You've got to parent your kids, right? He's also king of the kingdom. He's got to deal with the day-to-day or administrative or decisions, sorry, matters that required his decision. There were things he still had to do. There were things he still had to put his, 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 his responsibilities on. He had to fulfill those promises that he had made to his people. He had to do things. He, he had work. He had to do work. He had to still be concerned about things in his life. Mind you, he still had the enemies, huh? just that they weren't fighting. The Philistines were still there, just that they were not fighting. So there was a period of time when there was no war. And when life was going well, David did not say, I want to pursue more. I want to build God a temple. His, he kept his heart on God. He kept his heart on God. So when life is going well, this is what it means. God has given you rest. God has given you rest. doesn't mean rest is no stress, huh? But rest is in the midst of the stress, you are rested in God. You know that, yes, I've got work to do. I've got stress at work. I've got stress at home. I've got things to do. This is daily life. This is normal, routine, daily life for any of us. And yet, in the midst of those situations, God has given you a heart that is at rest. A heart that says, if I can trust in God, I don't have to be anxious about this. I don't have to fear. My heart is in God, my heart is in trusting in God, and so I can rest knowing that God has got my back. And then David looks out the window and says, God deserves a temple. He kept his heart on God. When life is going well, is your heart still kept on God? When life is going well, is your heart still kept on God? How do I know that my heart is kept on God? How do I know that I am focused and my heart is so desirous to honour God and to place God above myself? Three things that 2 Samuel 7 teaches us. And the first is this. You place God way above yourself. It's one thing to say I prioritise God in my life. Huh? It's another thing to say I place God way above myself. And here's how David did this. You see, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2 to 3. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, the Bible doesn't say what else David said, right? He said, okay, see, I live in the palace of cedar, God lives in the tent. I want to build a house for the Lord. No, it doesn't say that. He doesn't, he doesn't talk with Nathan and discuss, hey, so what should we do? Uh? Should we um, maybe raise the tabernacle up a bit more, put a nice foundation there? Put... None of that conversation took place. But Nathan heard David and he heard David's heart. And essentially, it is this. How can the ark of God be in a tent and I live in a wonderful, nice palace? And Nathan said, I know what you're thinking. Whatever is on your heart, do it because God is with you. Nathan didn't even question, no. Nathan didn't even say, hey, what's your budget? He didn't even question David in terms of what was on David's heart. And mind you, between 2 Samuel chapter 7 all the way to the end of David's reign as king, David made many, many, many questionable decisions. Decisions that even evil people will question him. You sure you want to do or not? I'll give you an example. Eh? Near the end of David's reign, David wanted to do a census. All right? Count all the mighty men from, from the whole of Israel. And then Joab, Joab, his commander, his general at the time, who's not really the best commander. Uh, he's not done everything right and proper. He's done evil things before in his life. But even he could tell David, you sure you want to do? Because you do this, it will increase your pride. It will cause your downfall. So David has made many, many questionable decisions in his life. And you will hear about that as you go along. But this one, Nathan didn't even question. He said, I know what's in your heart. You do it. You do it. Didn't even 
even talk to God, no. Do you even say, God, uh, I think David wants to build a temple for you. How, huh? Nathan said, I know what's on your heart. You do it. Here's what I want to say. If you place God way above yourself, it will be very clear. It will be so obvious. Sometimes people will come to you and say, why are you so holy one? And sometimes people will affirm you. But here's my suggestion to you. If you place God way above yourself, if you still keep your heart on God when things go well, and even, of course, when things go tough, if you place your heart on God and you keep lifting the name of God, you keep on uh, just saying in your heart that I want to place God way above myself, affirmation will come from the right people. Affirmation will come from the right people. The people whom God places over your life. The people whom God will speak into your life and they will say, I know what's on your heart. I will affirm what's on your heart. I'll give you a little example. Just in my own journey, my wife and I, for some of you, most of you have seen me here on stage. By the way, my wife is here today. <laughs> and you're wondering, like, hey, why your wife don't go to church? Huh? No, 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 it's not. She comes to church, all right? <laughs> the only thing is, for some of you who don't know, we serve in LifeGen, one of the SIBKL church plants. Um, and so we serve in LifeGen, and so our time and, and, and our, our family, uh, we attend LifeGen, so we don't come here as often as we um, we normally do for life gen, uh, but today we made it a point get the kids down to children's ministry and then uh, come here together to worship God together as a family. But one of the things we, we did as as a as 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 a family um, several years ago was decide to buy a house. Very normal decision. Looking at our house and then looking at other people's house, no, uh, <laughs> looking at the world around us. All right, and we thought if we have four kids, uh, I think this place that we're staying in now is not big enough anymore. But one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why we wanted to get a house was this. It was just not enough space to do two things. To host people, as in people coming to stay over at our place, but also to host groups of people. For example, a cell group or connect group or, or just fellowship in our house. Just because no, it's not enough space. Right? Uh, on, a, on a fine day when the kids' toys are all over the place, this is not enough space. And so, we, and so we thought about it, we prayed about it, we went through different houses. Some of you know our journey on this. Um, but here's what I want to tell you. I signed the sale and purchase agreement in 2019, September 2019, on a Friday. Two days later, two days later, um, LifeGen, uh, that time the campus ministry in SIBKL, LifeGen had an invited speaker. Some of you may have known, uh, know, will know him. His name is Pastor Isaac Ong from Singapore. He had a, we had a guest speaker. He come and, and he spent some time with the leaders uh, specifically and he started praying for us one by one by one by one. At that stage, my wife was pregnant with our third and so she sat on a chair while he was praying for us and so he prayed, I think it was you know, one hand on each of our heads, four heads and then he said this, I see a house. This is the first time I've ever met Pastor Isaac, all right? I told him this story many years later uh, when he came as a, as a camp speaker last year but I said, this is the first time we met you, you don't know me, I don't know you, all right? But he said, I see a house. Now my wife and I were like, I only signed the SPA two days ago. You know? Okay. What's even more wonderful about that was this. I see food, I see a table, and I see fellowship. That was essentially what was on our hearts. We wanted a host. We wanted to allow people to have fellowship in this place and open up our home so that people can come and be in this place with us, with, them, with each other. Here's my point to you. When you place God way above yourself, you will receive affirmation from the people whom God has placed over your life. People whom God will speak through into your life. And you know you've placed God way above yourself. There are many things that God will do as He affirms you in the things that you are doing because you're learning to place God way above yourself. But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you've got someone by the name of Nathan saying, I know exactly what's on your heart. Go and do it. Go and do it. He affirmed it. But the other thing then is this. How do I really know that David actually placed God in his heart way above himself. Besides affirmation. Because I said David was not a man of mere talk. He was of action. So here's where we're going to go. 
to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22 all the way to 29 is David talking about his preparations for the temple. And it starts off in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 14 to 16. I mean, it starts off in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 1, but look at verse 14 to 16. He's telling all of Israel, especially his son Solomon, and he says this, with great pains, with great pains, I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, a million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there is so much of it. I've, 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 I don't even bother weighing it anymore. And timber and stone too, I have provided. And then he tells Solomon, to this, you add on. I'll tell you how much 100,000 talents of gold is in a bit. But he's telling Solomon, you add on to this, all right? To this you add on, you have an abundance of workmen, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, all kinds of craftsmen without number. That means more than you can count. Skilled in working gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work, for the Lord is with you. Here is how much one talent is. If you have your Bibles and you've got the footnote there, right? One talent is 34 kilograms. How much gold, let's do a bit of math. How much gold did King David amass? 3.4 million kilograms in gold. I'm hoping I did my math right. I'm a lawyer, sorry, I, I didn't. No, I love math. 3.4 million kilograms in gold. How much silver did he collect? 34 million kilograms of silver. And that is the one you can count, no? Silver, like bronze and iron, millions and millions of kilograms, I believe. Cedar timber, dressed stones. And then in David's own heart, uh, for God's temple, uh, this is not enough. He tells his son, you add on. To these, you must add. So for the fun of it, I looked up the value of gold today. Oh, okay, this was Hari Raya time, right? So I, I checked the value at that time. I know it goes up and down every day, but it's 350,000 per kilogram. Ringgit. So Ringgit Malaysia, 350,000 per kilogram. You times that by 3.4 million kilograms of gold, and the first thing I noticed is my phone calculator, not enough zeros. Not enough space for zeros. It's 1.19 trillion Ringgit. 1.19 trillion ringgit in gold alone. Not counting silver, bronze, iron, timber, stones. 1.19 trillion ringgit in gold alone. It makes 1MDB look like child's play. 1.19 trillion ringgit in gold alone. And this is how important gold was for the temple. You realize later on, unfortunately, that when Israel was conquered or, or, or they, they decided to pay tribute to other kingdoms, they would take the gold from the temple to pay them. Because that was where all the gold was. And then when a king decided to show off his empire, show off his, the, the riches of Israel to some foreign king, they would bring him to the temple. Because that is what they saw, and they saw, wow, look at 1.19 trillion ringgit worth of gold. 3.4 million kilograms of gold just sitting in this house. Where is the first place the kings would ransack if they were to conquer Israel? And the Bible tells us, the temple. All the gold shields, the gold insignias, and, and all of that, the emblems, all of that made out of pure gold. Sure, I take lah. But that was the amount of gold David amassed. 3.4 million kilograms, aside from the silver, bronze, iron, timber, stones, all of that. So you know that Solomon definitely did his palace up as well. Huh? He spruced up his palace. But if you compare the provisions David made for the temple alone and David's own palace, the items in the temple were worth way more than David's own palace. Here's what's on David's heart. He told Solomon, 1 Chronicles 22, 6-7. He called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, 
I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. I had it in my mind. No, I had it in my heart. Forty years ago, I wanted to build the temple. Forty years later, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. You want to be mind blown even more? 1.19 trillion ringgit of gold, not enough, right? Silver, bronze, iron, dressed stones, timber. If you look from 1 Chronicles 22 to 29, I summarize for you. David prepared an entire team of priests, musicians, gatekeepers, treasurers, soldiers, and leaders for the temple. So it wasn't just raw materials. Eh? He actually prepared the entire country for it. He appointed people to prepare themselves. And some of them may even be already serving at the tabernacle, but he says, you prepare your people. He named them out. There is a list of people whose names are actually listed out. He named them out. He appointed them. He, he, he must have interviewed them, must saw them serving or whatever, and says, this guy, he's going to be a gatekeeper. This guy is going to be a musician. This guy is going to be a treasurer of the house of the Lord. He prepared the people for the temple. He prepared a blueprint for the temple. So he knew this is what the temple is going to look like. He drew it out. He said to Solomon, this is the blueprint for the temple. I've prepared it. I've spent my time looking through plans. I've worked it out with the ID guy. I've worked it out with the contractors. I've worked it out to make sure that the foundations are correct. This is the blueprint for the temple. What's even more interesting, I told you 3.4 million kilograms in gold, right? That's not his own goal, no. From his own goal, he puts in more. And so in 1 Chronicles 27 to 28, somewhere about that, he says that, from my own personal treasury, I give you more gold for the house of the Lord. And because he did that, the last one is this, he prepared an entire country by them giving free will offerings to the temple. So the amount of raw material for the temple was more than David had himself prepared. He put in his own personal treasury and then he got all of Israel to also submit offerings for the house of the Lord. And all of this was not meant for the kingdom. It was not meant for his palace. It was meant for the house of the Lord because in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 2, he repeats it again and says, I had it in my heart to build a house for the, of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for the building. So if you're wondering now, how in the world did David get so much gold, so much silver, iron, bronze, timber, dress stones, a blueprint, and a people fully prepared to build the temple of the Lord and serve God in a temple? My suggestion to you is this. David took all of his 40 years to do it. Maybe even more. Maybe even more than 40 years. Maybe even before he even became king, he was already building his gold stash. Maybe that's even why Nathan saw, I know what that gold was for. I remember you showed me that gold that day, right? The treasure chest there, right? I know that was for the temple, right? You go and do what's on your heart because God is with you. Maybe even more than 40 years. But the point is this, throughout 2 Samuel 7, all the way to 1 Chronicles 28, 29, this was God Sorry, this is God. This was David spending his entire lifetime amassing the gold and the silver and the iron and the bronze and the timber and the stones for the building of the temple. He kept on collecting. He kept on saving it. He kept on making deals with foreign kings to say, please give me your cedar to get raw materials. And so if you think about it then, this was essentially David's life's work. This is what blew my mind. You cannot, after 40 years, only suddenly realize, oh, I need 3.4 million kilograms of gold. This was his life's work. He spent his time, and I know the Bible doesn't say every single chapter, he, yes, he asked for more gold or he bought more silver or whatever. No, it doesn't say that. He had all these different problems with his son and with Bathsheba and, and all that story going on there. But from day one, from 2 Samuel 7 all the way to 1 Chronicles 28, 29, he was already collecting, already amassing, and in a place where there was no banking system. So don't have interest-bearing savings account. You just have to collect and collect and collect and collect and collect, and you amass all of that. He essentially gave Solomon the temple on a silver plate. You just have to build it. I've got it all for you already. 
It was his life's work. There were a lot of other things that 2 Samuel and Chronicles will tell you David had to deal with. But if you start, look from the start to the end, David pursued the building of the temple. It made it so easy for Solomon to just say, let's start, let's build it. So my question then to you is this, what's your life's work? What's your life's work? If you place God way above yourself, your life's work will be about hosting the presence of God. Your life's work will be about honouring God. Your life's work will be about helping others see it and do the same. Because that was what David did. He hosted the presence of God. He's saying this temple that will be built will be so wonderful. It will be Solomon says this, I think he reflected David's heart, but he said, look, the temple is awesome, the temple is, you know, wonderful in man's eyes, and yet, God, the earth is only your footstool. But what David will want to do is build this temple so awesome, so powerful, so majestic, so wonderful, because only God deserves that. And we have to build something that is deserving of the God of the universe. He placed God way above himself and said, this is how the temple is supposed to be built. He was concerned about where the ark was going to be placed, where the presence of God was going to be. Second one is he honoured God. So my question to you is, what is God worth to you? For David, it was his life's work. Gold, silver, iron, bronze, all so that this temple will be deserving, sorry, God will be deserving of this temple that it would host the presence of God and therefore must be way better than mine. And the last one is this. When David got all of Israel to do the same, can we do the same for people around us? And we say, we're going to host the presence of God and we say, this is our life's work. I'm not asking all of us to quit work and serve God full time. But what I'm saying is this. When you do your day to day, are you learning to host the presence of God, honouring God and helping others see the same? when you're a parent with your kids, when you're a boss with your employees, when you are a worker with your colleagues, whatever relationship you carry, are you hosting, honouring God and then helping others do the same? The question I asked earlier on is, how do you know that your heart is in this? How do you know that your, your heart is still kept on God? The first one is, you place God way above yourself. The second one is this, you experience the pleasure of God or you encounter the pleasure of God. Second Samuel chapter 7 has this entire conversation where God tells David through Nathan, this is my heart for you. I'm going to summarize that for you in four points. First of all, it says, God says, I never asked for it. I never asked for the temple. I, I asked for the tabernacle. Yes, I gave blueprint for the tabernacle, but I didn't ask for a temple. You are the first person to offer it to me and I see your heart. I'm so happy. And then he tells David three things. First of all, I've raised you up. I will do more. I will make your name great. I will make your kingdom great. I will give you rest from your enemies. More than that, I will honour your family. So your descendants, your son will build my temple. And by the time, Solomon was not even born yet. Huh? So he says, your son will build my temple and I will always love him. Although God does say, even though sometimes I will discipline him heavily, but I will always love him. My steadfast love will never leave him. And then the last one is this, your throne shall be established forever. It's like God telling David, you want to build my house? No need, your son will. It's okay. But here's what I will do for you. I will build your house. I will build your house, your family, your name, your generations, your descendants. I will build it and I will establish your throne forever. And I think David went like this, if he was Hokkien, huh? I haven't even built a temple. You think God simply makes covenant promises? No, because God knew what was going to happen. He knew David's heart was in the right place. David probably started collecting already and he knew he would follow through all the way until his dying days. And God was so, so, so happy. You want to know how God feels about this? Here's my little analogy. You know, as a parent, it's one thing to give your kids good gifts because they ask for it. But it's another thing to give good gifts because they made you happy. It's like they're asking for Ribena, and you're like, 
okay lah, since you ask, I love you, I give you. Or, you see Ribena on the shelf, and you know your kids, oh, they're so obedient today. You are not. And they go, yay! And then you get the Ribena. Because you're just like, you know, I want to give it to you. I'm so happy with you, with what you've done today, whatever. In both cases, you love them. No one's questioning that. But one scenario draws out from you so much pleasure and joy to give the gift. And I think that's how God expressed His pleasure over David. He was like, I'm so delighted in you. I, you know my heart, man. You know my heart. I'm so delighted in you. I'm so delighted. Not, not that the, the temple is nothing. You know, I can give you more gold than the temple has. But the fact that you wanted to build a temple that honors me, that hosts my presence, I'm so happy. And because of that, for you, I give you more than that. I establish your name, I establish your kingdom, I establish your family, and your throne will be established forever. And it's a prophetic declaration of the kingdom of heaven because Jesus was a son of David. So he was going more than just your name, your family, and all that. No, he was going all the way to salvation, all the way to the kingdom of God. And it says it will be established forever. I don't want God to merely tolerate me. I want God to be pleased with me. I want God to look at my life and go, oh, this one, I will bless you, man. You've made my life, so you've made me very happy. You've pleased me. But the last thing is this. If I know your heart is kept on God, if God said, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, what do we often reply? Thank you! And then sometimes you don't know what you do with the blessing. Here's how David responded. He placed God even higher. So you place God way above yourself. You encounter the pleasure of God. And once you've encountered the pleasure of God, you place God even higher than yourself. Because this is what David said. And even as I call the worship team up. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18 to 29. I'm going to summarize that for you. Two things. David's humility. He said, oh, who am I that you would make these promises over my life? Who am I to deserve anything that you have said you would give me? Who am I, Lord, that you would have chosen me? Who am I that you would have called me from when I was a youth and now placing me in this position over your people, your covenant people? Who am I that you would say my throne would be established forever? And then David honoured God and said, Who are you that you would do such a thing for me? He wasn't challenging God like, who do you think you are? No. He was more like, wow, who are you that you would do something like this for me? There is none like you. There is none like you. And David carried that heart of worship before God all the way to the end. All the way to the end. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, after giving all of Israel and his son Solomon, all the plans and all the raw materials and saying, I, this is all that I've prepared and got all of Israel to issue the free will offerings to the house of the Lord, he then tells Israel in three words, bless the Lord. All of his life, amassing all of this so that he would build a temple for the Lord. And here's the revelation I got, and I know it's not on the slides because I got it this afternoon as I was thinking about it. He wanted to build a temple and prepared all the materials, prepared the blueprint, prepared everybody for this temple. This temple got torn down. It was rebuilt. It got torn down again. And you remember this, if you followed us in our Bible series uh, over the years, you hear about the story of the, temp the second temple and Herod's temple and all that. All of them got torn down. But today, you are that temple. You host the presence of God. It is your heart that honours God. It is your heart that helps others see the same and honour God in their lives. What you build is not about the money, it is not about the, the wealth that you can bring for the temple, it's not about your brilliance in drawing up a blueprint for the temple. 
It is what your heart is doing in building yourself to host the presence of God. To honour God and to say, God, I want not just to worship you and honour you, but I'm going to call all of the people around me to say, bless the Lord. What's your life's work? David's life's work was a physical temple. But we don't have, or we don't need a physical temple because we are that temple. Yes, this building still exists for us together. But the presence of God is here and goes with you out of this place. You carry the presence of God because you are that temple. There are many other references in the New Testament, even as I'm thinking about it. David prepared a lot of stones, right? We've got one cornerstone and all of us are stones in the house of God. Essentially, it is this. Your heart, when life is going well, what does your heart pursue? If you place God above yourself, you encounter the pleasure of God and when you do, you place God even higher than before. You are building that temple inside of you as you carry the presence of God outside. You know what will make God so pleased? Because He lives inside of you is if you clean up here and dress it in gold and silver, not whitewash, huh? dress in gold and silver and iron and bronze. And the guy who lives inside of you, who is greater than anything in this world, looks inside here and goes, wow, this is nice. Thank you for taking your time and effort and your heart into building this temple so that I can sit and rest in this place. And in your life, I will move powerfully. Through you, people will see the Lord. Through you, lives will be changed. Through you, miracles, signs, and wonders. Through you, my face will be revealed. Through you, my love will be made known. Because I am so pleased with this temple that you've built. Can we rise, church? Can I just invite you to rise? As we worship the Lord, I want to just open up this place as an altar before the Lord. I want to encourage you. I know all of us at some point, uh, we are at some point in our lives in journeying with God and honouring God and hosting the presence of God in our lives. I know I'm, I'm there as well. I'm not, I've, not, I've not reached the end of it. I've not hit the pinnacle of, of hosting the presence of God. No, I will, do, I, I will do this all the way to my dying days. I will continue to grow in God more and more each day. But as an offering to the Lord, as an act of surrender to the Lord, I want to open up this place for us to just come before God and say, God, I want to keep my heart focused on you, when life, especially when life is going well. Some of you, I know your life is not going well. That, that we understand. But even in those moments, keep your heart on God. Keep your heart focused on God. But if God has given you rest, also keep your heart on God. And this is the place to just come before God and say, God, I surrender to you. I want to keep my heart focused on God. I want to keep my heart focused on you, Lord. And begin to build that temple. Begin to honour God. Begin to host the presence of God. And so we may pray for you, we may not, depending on how many of you come. But when you come down here, I want it to be I want to encourage you to make this a place where you say, God, here's my life. I want to focus on you. I want to fix my heart on you. It's no longer the thought that counts. It's my heart that counts. And I want to place you above myself.